be able to welcome our external adjudicator. And this is one of those occasions where I can genuinely say that for many of you, our judge this afternoon needs absolutely no introduction whatsoever. It is a real delight to be welcoming back to Highfield a Mrs. Susanna Cryer, uh, who many of you will remember as our head of drama, uh, English teacher, and of course our head of boarding. She is now the deputy head pastoral at Thomas's School in Battersea in London. And it is an absolute delight, as I said, to see you back with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. I don't envy you the task, I have to say. I am extraordinarily excited about what we are about to witness. Very, very best of luck to all of you. And I will announce our first performer shortly. And indeed, our first performer this afternoon, representing Waterloo, is Adelina, who will be reciting Blame by Alan Alberg. Blame by Alan Alberg. Graham, look at Maureen's leg. She says you tried to tattoo it. I did, miss, yes, with my biro, but Jonathan told me to do it. Graham, look at Peter's sock. It's got a burn hole through it. It was just an experiment, miss, with the lens, but Jonathan told me to do it. Alice's bag is stuck to the floor. Look, Graham, did you glue it? Yes, but I never thought it would work, and Jonathan told me to do it. Jonathan, what is all this I've heard about you and Graham Pruitt? Well, miss, it's really more his fault, because he tells me to tell him to do it. Adelina, thank you for getting the recitation competition off to such a wonderful start. Uh, we will now hear representing... Trafalgar, Felix reciting Supply Teacher by Alan Alberg. Supplies Teacher by Alan Alberg. Here's the rule for what to do whenever your teacher has the flu or for some other reason takes to her bed and a different teacher comes instead. When this visiting teacher hangs up her hat, writes the date on the board and does this and that, always remember the message is this. Our teacher never does that, miss. If you want to change places or wander about or feel like getting the guinea pig out, always remember the message is this. Our teacher always lets us miss. And when your teacher returns next day and complains about the paint and clay, always remember the message is this. That other teacher told us to miss. <laughs> Well, I did warn Mrs. Cryer that it was going to be tough, goodness. Uh, we will now hear for Agincourt, Rex reciting Dazzle Dance by John Rice. Dazzle Dance by John Rice. I have an eye of silver, I have an eye of gold, I have a tongue of regret and a story to be told. I have a hand of metal, I have a hand of clay, I have two arms of granite and a song for every day. I have a foot of damson, I have a foot of corn, I have two legs of leaf stock and a dance for every morn. I have a dream of water, I have a dream of snow, I have a thought of wildfire and a harp string long and low. I have an eye of silver, I have an eye of gold, I have a tongue of regus and a story to be told. Thank you, Rex. For Waterloo now, Frederick and Greeks by Anon. Clever Greeks by Anonymous. The ancient Greeks invented many things like watermill steam engines and maps. They founded democracy, drama and philosophy. The ancient Greeks were really clever chaps. Astronomers from Greece worked that the Earth goes around the Sun. It took hundreds of years before everyone else caught on. 
A genius called Archimedes once had an idea that made him shout, Eureka! He jumped out of his bath and ran down the path, then ran about naked like a streaker. Another genius called Pythagoras once found out a very famous sum. This guy, though, unlike the other fellow, did not show everyone his bum. <laughs> There, the Greeks were not always highbrow. Uh, now for Trafalgar, Louis and Bobby, also by Anon. Bobby by Anonymous. When Bobby got angry, his face went bright red. The blood in his body went straight to his head. He fought with his teachers. He pushed and he pulled. He clawed like a tiger and he charged like a bull. They couldn't control him, but neither could he. He was trapped by his temper and he couldn't break through. We gazed in amazement and muttered, how bad. But the truth is, we like it when Bobby gets mad. <laughs> And our final performer now for Agincourt, uh, that's our final performer in year four, of course, uh, Isla, my teacher, ate my homework by Ken Nesbitt. My teacher ate my homework by Ken Nesbitt. My teacher ate my homework. I'm aware it's rather rod. She sniffed at it and smiled with an approving sort of nod. She gave a little nibble, it's unusual, but true, and somewhat gave a larger bite and gave a thoughtful chew. I think she must have liked it, for she really went to town. She gobbled it with gusto, and she wolfed the whole thing down. She licked off all her fingers, gave a burp and said, you pass. I guess that's how they grade you when you're taking a cooking class. has to be some winners but not to say that you all didn't do brilliantly so in third place we have Louis in second place we have uh, Isla and in first place we have Adelina well done <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Year 4, for getting us off to such a brilliant start. Uh, we now move on into the middle school and Year 5. And our first performer for Trafalgar is Annabelle with The Museum by Marion Swinger. The Museum by Marion Swinger. Here we are, children, the museum. In we go. This way, everybody. Shh, quiet. Just look at that carving, a lost art. Observe those statues, the craftsmanship. Oh, look, hieroglyphics. Study them, children, study them. Children, <gasps> the children have gone. Miss Prothero rushes here and there in a panic. She can see it all in the papers the next day. The headlines, whole class vanishes. Teacher, blamed. Miss Prothero goes hot all over. Where are the children? They are with the mummies. No, not their mummies, the mummies. They are gathered round a glass case, gloating ghoulishly. Oh, those musty wrappings, that black shriveled arm. They are faint with delight. This is what they have come to see. Thank you, Annabelle. We move on with Millie of Agincourt reciting A Shiver of Sharks by Andrea Pryor.
A Shiver of Sharks by Andrea Fryer. Sharks make me shiver and quiver and dither. Their huge snarling mouths, their small beady eyes, their very large teeth and their humongous size. In the blue of the ocean they swim and they stare. They're scary and creepy, so don't you dare. Go so close, you may never come back. Mr. Shark may eat you and that will be that. Thank you, Millie. We now have for Waterloo, Sophie reciting, Last Night I Dreamed of Chickens by Jack Prolutsky. Last night I dreamed of chickens by Jack Prolutsky. Last night I dreamed of chickens. There were chickens everywhere. They were standing on my forehead. They were nesting in my hair. They were pecking, they were, sorry. They were pecking at my pillow. They were hopping on my head. They were ruffling up their feathers as they raced about my bed. They were on the chairs and tables. They were on the chandeliers. They were roosting in the corners. They were clucking in my ears. There were chickens, 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 for as far as I could see. And when I woke up, I noticed there were eggs on top of me. <laughs> well, no chickens and sharks this time. Uh, for Trafalgar, we have Iona reciting, Saw My Teacher on Saturday, by Dave Crawley. I saw my teacher on Saturday by Dave Prawney. I saw my teacher on Saturday. I can't believe it's true. I saw her buying groceries like normal people do. She reached for bread and turned around and then she caught my eye. She gave a smile and said, hello, I thought I would die. Oh, um, uh, hello, Miss Appleton. I mumbled like a fool. I guess I thought that teacher types spend all their time at school. To make the situation worse, my mum was at my side. So many rows of cans and jars, so little room to hide. Oh, please, I thought, don't tell my mum what I did yesterday. I closed my eyes and held my breath and hoped she'd go away. Some people think it's fine to let teachers walk about, but when it comes to Saturdays, they shouldn't let them out. <laughs> Oh dear, I was rather looking forward to being let out tomorrow. Um, <laughs> thank you, Iona. Um, we now have for Agincourt, Jacob reciting Diary of a School Trip by Matt Simpson. Diary of a School Trip by Matt Simpson. Day one, we arrive. It's pouring. Day two, I'm still alive this morning. Day three, I got soaking wet canoeing. Day four, now I'm chewing. Day five, stuck in the sniffing dorm. Day six, I wanna go back home. Day seven, wobbly like a welly with my socks sweat and smelly. I'm heading back along the track to home and what's on there? Telly. Thank you, Jacob. And finally, in year five, representing Waterloo, we have Alec reciting Grounded by Eric Finney. Grounded by Eric Finney. Grounded by Dad! That's not too bad. He just says, it's the kind of trouble I got into as a lad. Of course it doesn't mean I can ignore it. You must take your punishments. I can't withdraw it. I'll reduce it from a week to seven days. Funny joke. No, three days. And tonight we'll watch the match and I'll treat you to a Coke. Grounded by mum. That's grim. That's clum. No Saturday matches. No phone calls. And no 
pocket money. No way she'll ever change her mind. It isn't funny. She goes on and on and on and won't leave it. She really means it. You better believe it. So we move on now into year six, and for Agincourt, Lydia and Formula 86, Delayed Action Mouse Maker, by Roald Dahl. Formula 86, <coughs> Formula 86, Delayed Action Mouse Maker, by Roald Dahl. <coughs> Down with the children. Do them in, boil their bones and fry their skin. Bish them, squish them, bash them, mash them. Break them, shake them, slash them, smash them. Offer chocks with magic powder. Say eat up, then say it louder. Cram them full of sticky eats and send them home to guzzling sweets. And in the morning, the little fools go marching off to separate schools. A girl feels sick, she goes up hell, she yells, hey look, I've grown a tail. A boy who's standing next to her screams, hey look, I'm growing fur. Another pimpers, we look like freaks, there's viscous growing on our cheeks. A boy who is extremely tall cries out, hey look, I'm growing small. And all at once, all in a trice, there are no children, only mice. In every school, it's mice galore, all running, running around the classroom floor. And the poor demented teachers is yelling, Hey, what are these creatures? They stand up on desks and begin to shout, Get out, you filthy mice, get out! Will someone get some mouse traps, please? And don't forget to bring the cheese. Now mouse traps come in every trap, go snippity snip and snippity snap. The traps have very powerful springs. They go snap, pat, pom, and ping. It's a lovely sound for us to hear. It's music to a witch's ear. Dead mice are stacked all around, just two feet above the ground, with teachers searching left and right. But still, there are no children left in sight. The teachers yell, what's going on? Where have all the children gone? It's half past nine, and as a rule, no child can be this late for school. The poor teachers don't know what to do. Some sit around and read, and just a few amuse themselves throughout the day by brushing some of the mice away. And all us witches shout, Hooray! Thank you, Lydia. We now hear from Christo who will recite Casabianca by Felicia Dorothea Hermand. I will be performing Casabianca by Felicia Dorothea Hermand. The boy stood on the burning deck went all but he had fled. The flame that lit the battle's wreck shone around him, oh, the dead. Yet beautiful and bright he stood, as born to rule the storm, a creature of heroic blood, a proud, though childlike form. The flames rolled on, he would not go without his father's word, that father Faint in death below, his voice no longer heard. He called aloud, say, Father, say, if yet my task is done. He knew not that the chieftain lay, unconscious of his son. Speak, Father, once again he cried, if I may yet be gone. And, but the booming shot replied, and fast the flames rolled on. Upon his brow he felt their breath, and in his waving hair, and looked from that lone post of death. In still yet brave despair, 
and shouted, but once more aloud, My father, must I stay? While o'er him fast, through sail and shroud, the wreathing fires made way. They wrapped the ship in splendour wild, they caught the flag on high, and streamed above the gallant child, like banners in the sky. There came a burst of thunder sound. The boy, oh, where was he? Asked the winds that far around, with fragments strewed the sea. With mast and helm and pen and fair, that well had borne their part. But the noblest thing that perished there was that young and faithful heart. Thank you, Christo. Now for Trafalgar, Harry and If Dogs Could Talk by Ken Nesbitt. If Dogs Could Talk by Ken Nesbitt. If dogs could talk, I think our dog would have a lot to say. He'd probably tell my brother, sit. Oh, just stay. He'd probably tell my Sister, how about an ice cream cone? He'll probably tell my mother, please go get me a nice big bone. He'll probably tell my father, make a left turn up ahead! And he'll probably tell me, kid, tonight, I'm sleeping in your bed. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. For Agincourt now, Freya and All Great Excuses by Ken Nesbitt. All Great Excuses by Ken Nesbitt. I started on my homework, but my pen ran out of ink. My hamster ate my homework, my computer's on the blink. I tripped and dropped my homework in the soup my mum was cooking. My brother flushed it down the toilet when I wasn't looking. My mother ran my homework through the washer and the dryer. An aeroplane crashed into our house. My homework caught on fire. Tornadoes blew my notes away. Volcanoes rocked our town. My books were taken hostage by an evil killer clown. An alien abducted me. I had a shark attack. A pirate swiped my homework and refused to give it back. I worked on these excuses so darn long, my teacher said. I think You'll find it easier if you do the work instead. Thank you, Freya. I can't imagine what teacher you had in mind there. Uh, we now have for Waterloo, Romilly and the Dentist and the Crocodile by Roald Dahl. The Dentist and the Crocodile by Roald Dahl. The crocodile, with a cunning smile, sat in the dentist's chair. He said, right here and everywhere, my teeth require a pair. The dentist's face was turning white. He quivered, quaked and shook. He muttered, I suppose I'll have to take a look. I want you, the crocodile declared, to do the back ones first. The molars at the very back are easily the worst. The poor old, the, the dentist with a cunning, oh. Um, the dentist kept himself well clear. He stood two yards away. He chose the longest probe he had to search out the decay. I said to do the back ones first, the crocodile called out. You're much too far away, dear sir, to see where you're about. To do the back ones properly, you've got to put your head deep down inside my great big mouth, the grinning crocky said. The poor old dentist wrung his hands, and weeping in despair, he cried, No, no, I see them all extremely well from here. Just then, in a burst, a lady, in a hand to golden chain. She cried, oh, croc, you naughty boy, you're playing tricks again. Watch out, the dentist shrieked, and started climbing up the wall. He's after me, he's after you, he's going to eat us all. 
Don't be a twit, the lady said, and flashed a gorgeous smile. He's harmless. He's my little pet, my lovely crocodile. Thank you, Romilly. So our final competitor now in the middle school, uh, this is for Trafalgar. It's Daisy and Smile by Spike Milligan. Sm Smile by Spike Milligan. Smiling is infectious, you catch it like the flu. When someone smiled at me today, I started smiling too. I passed around the corner and someone saw my grin. When I smiled, I realised I passed it on to him. I thought about that smile and realised what it's worth. A single smile, just like mine, can travel around the earth. So if you feel a smile begin, don't leave it undetected. Let's start an epidemic quick to get the world infected. So, year five, well done again. So, this is so, so much joy in the room, and isn't it lovely to be able to be performing when we haven't been able to do that for such a long time? So, uh, starting with just to go through some of these, Annabelle, where are you, Annabelle? Oh, she's gone. Oh, well, she was fabulous and uh, had lots of pace um, and was very steady, which was a, a nice thing to see. Um, Millie, where are you? Millie, well done, Millie. Um, lovely face expressions. You really used your face, which is just fantastic. That just tells the story, which was delightful. And the other thing you did, which was nice, is you changed volume. So you had really loud uh, moments, but you also had soft moments. And that's always lovely to have a bit of... Um, of, of change in that. Uh, Sophie, where's Sophie? Hello Sophie, well done. Um, uh, I know there was a little blip, a, a little moment, I don't want to draw attention to it, but I, what I do want to draw attention to is the fact you kept going, and that is just amazing when you have those moments, because actually it takes such a lot of courage to do that, so amazing job, well done. And a really lovely uh, poem as well by um, Jack Pilutsky, so well done you. Uh, Iona, Where's Iona? Well done, Iona. You have fantastically expressive eyes. Just beautiful, really lovely. And they're the, the, um, the, the key to the soul, the eyes. So I just loved your eyes were telling the story, which was delightful. Well done. And then Jacob. Jacob. So Jacob, what I loved about you, you had a real calmness about you before you started, which was really nice. And actually, when you see that calmness, it's really nice when you are listening to performances. So that was lovely that you were able to do that. That's hard. And lastly, for year five, of course, we had Alec. Um, and you had some really interesting vocal pitch. You had some really, used your voice, highs and lows, all the way through, which again is lovely to make it so interesting to listen to. So for our winners for year five, and again, you've all done fantastically. Um, in third place, we have Annabelle. In second place, we have Alec. And in first place, we have Millie. So if you want to come up, guys, well done. Excellent job. <laughs> which is lovely because learning all of those words is extraordinary, but also uh, changing in sort of topic and theme which is as we go up the school. So first we had Lydia. Um, and Lydia, I love that you chose... Where's Lydia? There you are, Lydia. I love that you chose to do an accent. It's a really brave choice, but absolutely brilliant. And you went... You sustained that accent all the way through, and it didn't um, decry from what an amazing poem it was. You did a really, really good job there. Well done. Um, Christo, Christo, well done. Again, an extraordinary poem, really, really extraordinary. And your poise, so I mean that stillness, was fantastic, really, really good. And, and that's a challenging, challenging uh, words, challenging um, uh, uh, vocabulary, and you really tackled that well, so well done. Uh, Harry, well done, Harry. Um, Harry, I tell you, you really got the humour of that. It's fantastic, you really understood the humour all the way through. So I'm just, I don't know if you've got a great sense of humour, but you clearly understood it. So that was fantastic. Well done, Harry. And Freya, Freya, um, Fred, lovely um, pitch. 
So you, had, you were able to go high and low again in your voice. I know we've mentioned this before, but it's really important to change up what, how you speak when you're doing poetry. So that was lovely. And again, your facial expressions were fabulous as well. So that was good. And then Romilly. Romilly, well done, Romilly. Um, super poem, The Dent of the Cross. In fact, I got a little bit scared because you pointed at me straight away when you said uh, at the beginning. And that was lovely. To engage with your audience is, is again, quite challenging, actually, because you've just got to go for it. And you really did that. Um, so well done. Really, a really good version of that poem. And then lastly, we had uh, Daisy. Daisy, well done. Daisy, I feel you really enjoyed yourself. You were so relaxed, which actually makes us as the listener relax as well. And that's a really, really challenging thing to be able to do to make us want to listen to you. So well done on that. So um, huge round of applause for, sorry, yeah, I should have said for year five and year six, and then I'll give, do the winners. So well done to year five. <laughs> Romilly in second place, Lydia, and in first place, Christo. Well, well done, years five and six, and thank you, Mrs. Cryer. Uh, we now move into the final stages of our competition with our senior school competitors starting in Year 7 and representing Waterloo uh, with Jasper, who will perform The Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. I'll be performing Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. It was brillig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, the moon raps out grave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in offish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snuck. He left it dead. And with its head, he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Oh, come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, frabjous day, canoe, canoe. He chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the moan rats out grave. Thank you, Jasper. I think I saw about a dozen people leap when you first introduce the Jabberwock. Uh, we'll now hear uh, from Amelia who will recite The Porcupine by Roald Dahl, and this is for Trafalgar House. The Porcupine by Roald Dahl. Each Saturday I shout hooray, for that's my pocket money day. After breakfast, 50p my generous father gave to me. Like lightning down the road I ran, until I reached the sweet shop man and brought the chocolates of my dreams. A great big bag of raspberry creams. There is a secret place I know where I quite often like to go. Beyond the woods, behind some rocks, a super place for guzzling chocks. When I arrived, I 
quickly found a comfy looking little mound. It was quite clean and round and earthy brown, just right, I thought, for sitting down. And there I would sit all morning long and eat until my chocks were gone. I sat, I screamed, I jumped a foot. Would you believe I had put that tender little rump of mine upon a giant porcupine? My backside seemed to catch on fire, a hundred bits of red hot wire, a hundred prickles sticking in and puncturing my precious skin. I ran home and shouted, Mom, behold the prickles in my bum. My mother, all, who always keeps her head, bent down to look and said, I personally am not about to try and pull those prickles out. I think a job like this requires the services of Mr. Myers. I shouted, no, not the dentist, no. Oh, Mum, won't you have a go? I begged her twice. I begged her thrice. But grown-ups never take advice. She said, the dentist's very strong. He pulls things out the whole day long. She rushed me quickly into town. And there they turned me upside down upon the awful dentist's chair while two strong nurses held me there. Entered the dreaded Mr. Myers, waving a massive pair of pliers. This is, he replied with obvious glee, a new experience for me. Quite honestly, I can't pretend I've ever pulled anything out from this end. He started pulling one by one, yelling, my oh my, what fun. I shouted, help, I shouted, ow, he said, don't worry, it's nearly over now. For heaven's sake, don't scroll about. He'll go to that one that's going out. The dentist bawled and out it came. And then I heard the man exclaim, Now, let us talk these as that'll be. Fifty guineas, please. My mother is a gutsy bird and never one to mince a word. She cried, By gosh, that's jolly steep. He said, No, it's very cheap. My dear lady, don't you see that if it hadn't been for me, this child would have gone another year with prickles sticking in her ear. So that was that. Oh, what a day, and what a fuss. And by the way, I think I know why porcupines cover themselves with prickly spines. It is to stop some silly clown from squashing them by sitting down. Don't copy me, don't be a twit. Be sure to look before you sit. Thank you, Amelia. We now move on with a change of mood, uh, right off Agincourt, reciting The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveller long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it went in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the parson there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black, or I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted, if I should ever come back. I should be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in the woods, and I, I took the one less travelled by. And that has made all the difference. Thank you, Ryder. For Waterloo now, Harry and Strict by Michael Rosen. Strict by Michael Rosen. I had a teacher that was so strict, you weren't even allowed to breathe in her lessons. She used to stand up there going, no breathing, and you had the whole morning to get through. The weak ones just kneeled over and died. You'd hear them going down behind you. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And there's always be that one of Wynicky going, Miss, can I go out and do some breathing? And she'd say, no, you've got all playtime to do so. 
and, oh, come on, Miss, oh, come on. Did you know, at the beginning of the week, there were 48 kids in my class. At the end, there were only five of them left. You'd be stepping over kids just to get out of the classroom. <gasps> oh, no, there's Melanie. That's a shame. She was really nice. There's Dave. Hard luck, Dave. Always knew he was a bit weak. <laughs> you know, people say to me, if that's true, how come you're here to tell the tale? Fair enough, and I'll tell you. Because when we were at school, we used to sit at desks. We didn't sit round tables like you do now. We used to sit at desks with lids. So, a few of us figured out what you had to do was <gasps> snatch a quick breath underneath the desk lids when the teacher wasn't looking. So, once more, from the beginning. No breathing! The weak ones, kabum, kabum, kabum. The wine ones, Miss, can I go and do some breathing? No, you've got all play time to do so. Oh, go on, Miss, oh, go on. That was a mistake, slamming the desk leg down. If you made even the slightest noise with the desk, it was out, school prison. There was school prison underneath the school hall with it stringy for the bars on the walls. Miss, I've been up here for three weeks and there's rats and they're nibbling my toenails. So I figured out what you had to do was put your thumbs around the edge of the desk lid so when you took a quick breath, there'd be no noise at all. So once more from the beginning, no breathing. The weak ones, kabum, kabum, kabum. The whiny ones. Miss, can go and do some breathing? No, you've got all playtime to do so. Out, school prison. Miss, I've been up here for three weeks and there's rats and they're nibbling my toenails, miss. Thumbs around the edge of the desk lid, no noise at all. Survival! Thank you, Harry. What a ghastly school. So, now for Trafalgar, Poppy will recite You Are Old, Father William, by Edward Lear. You Are Old, Father William, by Lewis Carroll. You are old, Father William, the young man said and your hair's become very white. And yet you incessantly sound your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feel it might injure the brain. But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why well, do it again and again? You're old, said the Eve, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By use of this ointment, which in the box, allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife. And the muscular strength which you gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. You are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever. Can you balance an eel on the end of your nose? What made you so awfully clever? I've answered three questions and that's enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off, or I'll kick you down the stairs. Thank you, Poppy. So our final competitor now in year seven uh, is George, representing Agincourt, will recite, I don't like poetry, by Joshua Siegel. I don't like poetry by Joshua Siegel. I don't like similes. Every time I try to think of one, my brain feels like a vast, empty desert. 
My eyes feel like raisins floating in an ocean. My fingers feel like sweaty sausages. I don't like metaphors. Whenever I attempt them, a hammer starts beating my chest. Lava starts bubbling through my veins. Zombies have a fight in my stomach. I don't like alliteration. We learnt about it in school. It's seriously, stupendously silly. Definitely drastically difficult. Terribly, troublingly tricky. I don't like onomatopoeia. I wish you could blow it up with a zap and a bang and a crash. A boom, a clang and a pow. A zap, a bam and a thud. And I don't like repetition. I don't like repetition. <laughs> I don't like repetition. I really don't like repetition. Thank you. Thank you, George. We now move then into year eight and our first year eight performer representing Trafalgar is Henrietta reciting The Jumblies by Edward Lear. The Jumblies by Edward Lear. They went to sea in a sieve. They did. In a sieve. They went to sea. In spite of all their friends could say, on a winter's morn, on a stormy day, in a sieve, they went to sea. When the sieve turned round and round, everyone cried, you'll all be drowned. But they called aloud, our sieve ain't big, but we don't care a button, we don't care a fig, and as if we'll go to sea. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. They sailed away in a sieve, they did. In a sieve, they sailed so fast, with only a beautiful pea-green veil tied with a ribbon by way of a sail to a small tobacco pipe mast. And everyone said, who saw them go, oh, oh won't they be so upset? You know, for the sky is dark and the voyage is long, and what happened may is extremely wrong in a sieve to sail so fast. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue and they went to sea in a sieve. Thank you, Henrietta. We'll now hear, representing Agincourt, Gil reciting Oh, the Places You'll Go by Dr. Zeus. Oh, the Places You'll Go by Dr. Zeus. Congratulations! Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know. And you are the guy who'll decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you'll say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good street. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew, just go right along, you'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go, you'll be on your way up, you'll be seeing great sights, you'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind, because you'll have the speed, you'll pass the whole gang, and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest. <sighs> Except when you don't. Because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly, it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. 
And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. You come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're darked. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? <coughs> and if you go in, should you turn left or right? Or right in three quarters? Or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple, it's not, I'm afraid you'll find, for a mind maker-upper to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start into race down long wiggled roads at a break-necking pace and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space, headed, I fear, toward a most useless place. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying. You'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing, with banner flip flapping once more your right high, ready for anything under the sky. Ready, because you're that kind of guy. Oh, the places you'll go, there is fun to be done. There are points to be scored, there are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest wearer of all. Fame! You'll be as famous as famous can be, with the whole wide world watching you win on TV. Except when they don't. Because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win, because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not. Alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance. You'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go, though the weather be foul. On you will go, though your enemies prowl. On you will go, though the hack and crats howl. Onward up many a frightening creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far, and face up to your fears, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact. And remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft and never mix up your right foot from your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed! 98 and 3 quarters percent guaranteed! Kid, you'll move mountains! So, be your name Buxpan or Bixby or Bray or Mordecai Ali Van Allen O'Shea! You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So, get on your way! Thank you, Gil. For Waterloo now, Angela and Depression by K.M. Depression by K.N. Depression is a war against yourself. Every thought is a bullet. Every movement is a punch. Every word is a stab in the heart. Depression is a thief stealed everything you once had. Everything left behind is the things that keeps you trapped. Depression is a murder. It killed the girl I used to be. I look in the mirror and I see this thing. 
Depression is a zombie. You're alive, but you're dead. You're unaware of what's happening. You're the walking dead. Depression is a nightmare. You wake up into a hell. Everything seems impossible to bear. You're afraid of living. Depression is the ocean, a sea of emotions. You're drowning every day. However, you're never saved. Depression is a bottomless ending pit, never ending pain, never ending struggles. There's no light, there's no escape. Depression is a war, a constant battle within yourself. I think I might surrender, for I had enough. Depression is a war. You either win or you die trying. And I'm afraid to say I'm losing. Thank you, Angela. For Trafalgar now, Archie Seas of Thieves by Non, but with additional lines added by Archie himself. Ah, Seas of Thieves from the game Seas of Thieves by Anomalous and me. The world is changing, new dangers there be. Between boundless skies and treacherous seas. On rolling waves, with sails unfold, ships come to plunder this new world. The outposts they rain on in fire and flames. The ships they sink in glory of a name. The world that never seems the same, the place only described as the sea. And this, Archie out, Trafalgar. Thank you, Archie. For Agincourt now, Annabelle will recite Talking Turkeys by Benjamin Zephaniah. It's my fourth year, it never gets any easier. <laughs> Talking Turkeys by Benjamin Zephaniah. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas, because turkeys just want to have fun. <laughs> turkeys are cool. Turkeys are wicked. And every turkey has a mum. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. Don't eat it, keep it alive. It could be your mate and not on your plate. Say, yo, turkey, I'm on your side. I have lots of friends with turkeys. Not all of them have a right to a life. Not to be caged up, genetically made up by any farmer and his wife. Turkeys just want to play reggae. Turkeys just want to hip hop. Imagine a nice young turkey saying, hey man, I cannot wait for the chop. Turkeys like getting presents. They want to watch Christmas TV. Turkeys have brains and turkeys feel pain. In many ways, like you and me. I once knew a turkey. His name was Turkey. And he said, Benji, explain to me, please. Who put the turkey at Christmas? And what happens to the Christmas trees? And I said, I'm not too sure, turkey. It's nothing to do with Christmas. People get greedy and waste more than need be, and businessmen make loads of cash. So be nice to your turkeys this Christmas and spare them the cut of the knife. Join Turkeys United and they'll be delighted and you will make new friends for life. Thank you, Annabelle. And our final 
performer this afternoon. For Waterloo is Flora who will recite The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I cannot travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. I also said the task of having to decide who the best performers were was always a tough one, and I think it's as tough as ever this afternoon, and particularly in our final category of year seven and eight. So the very best of luck, Mrs. Cryer. Right, well done, year seven, eight, and well done to the audience, because it's a lot of listening, and you've really, really engaged in that, so um, well done you two as well. So, on to year seven and eight. And yes, the material has definitely changed moving from, from up, moving up the school. So um, it's been really interesting listening to that. Um, we started with Jasper and the Jabberwocky. Um, and this is such a performance poem. And you really, where are you, Jasper? There you are. And you really, really inhabited the whole story. And you took us on that journey. It was uh, really lovely. And actually, I saw people really sitting up and listening, or oh, you just sat up then, um, sitting up and listening when, when he performed. So Jasper, that was really good. Well done you. Um, then we had Amelia with the porcupine. And uh, where are you, Amelia? Well done. Yeah, Amelia, um, lovely storytelling. You even had props, which is always fabulous to see. Great, you really took us on the journey of that story and had lovely uh, different voices, different expression of voices. It was lovely, um, a really lovely uh, st uh, piece of storytelling. And then we had Ryder uh, with Robert Frost. And, um, and I really um, want to congratulate those of you that chose poems that had the slightly more challenging um, sort of content. And, and you had super um, diction. You finished every word, and I heard every letter at the end of every sentence. And that is really important when we're doing any sort of uh, recitation of poetry. So well done, Ryder. Then we had Harry uh, with Strict. Um, I actually don't know this poem, but Harry, I think you might have a future in stand-up, actually. You had an extraordinary um, uh, relationship with the audience. I thought it was amazing, really brave, and just great comic timing. So maybe that will be your future, I don't know. Um, and then we had Poppy. Poppy. Well done, uh, Poppy. Um, lovely, lovely. You've got a super tone to your voice. You've got a lovely low tone to your voice, which is really nice. It means you're really using your diaphragm, which is something I would always talk about when teaching drama. So I really felt that you've got that. So you've got a lovely pitch there. So well done uh, with that. So that's hard to do at, this, at your age. And really good eye contact as well. Um, and then we had George um, with I Don't Like Poetry. And George, uh, where are you, George? George, um, you have a great relationship with the audience all the way through. You really talk to them about it. I don't, again, I'm not familiar with that poem. Um, but you really told the story and, and um, your alliteration, getting your mouth around all of those different words and all those different poetic terms was, um, was so, so good. I was really impressed with that. So well done, George. Really good work. So uh, for year seven, for our first, second and third, but again, always so difficult, I have to say. Really, really difficult. Uh, in third place, we had Amelia. In second place, we had George. And in first place, we had Jasper. Not least, 
with year eight. Right, we had lots of different things, and actually with year eight, I think um, really useful to have some, um, uh, some constructive thoughts as well, just about with now that you're in year eight, and just with all of the things that uh, you have to think about when you're performing. Um, we start with Henrietta. Um, great ease, Henrietta, with the audience. You obviously enjoy uh, doing poetry, I could tell that. You have a really lovely um, understanding of rhythm and cadence, which I thought was super, and great sense of humour. Um, and your focus, con you continued all the way through um, with your focus. You didn't lose that focus, um, uh, even though there was a moment of pace and I'd, uh, a question over pace. But I really was impressed with how you continued with that focus. So well done. Um, then we had Gil. Uh, an exceptional memory, Gil. Extraordinary, just to start with. But um, uh, you, 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 it was sort of a bit like a piece of music, I felt. And uh, you sort of played it a little bit with a bit of crescendo and a little bit of diminuendo and all of that, which was really interesting, the way you paced it. Because with a long poem, you've got to find a way of engaging everybody the whole way through. So I, I thought you did really well. One little thing I would always say is make sure you go right to the end of the line. Don't let it die down at the end. A bit like with a piece of music, actually. Um, just make sure you push through with your breath all the way through the end of the line. But um, lovely musicality and pace. So uh, a, a real achievement. Well done. Gill. Um, then we had Angela. Um, Angela, what a, a, a really difficult topic to talk about. And do you know what was extraordinary, Angela? When you started, when the audience realised that what you were talking about was something that was quite serious, the whole room completely changed the atmosphere. And you did that. And I thought that was really impressive how you managed to hold that room. Um, with that topic, so that's really tough. So again, with you, I would also mention try not to go to, uh, quiet at the end of lines. Try and push through with your breath would be my uh, would be my only comment on that. But really impressive, well done. Uh, then we had Archie um, with his own added content, which I think is amazing that you just put you put that out there with it, and, and you have a lovely presence. I know you're tall, but you certainly had a lovely presence here, and that was really um, uh, really uh, obvious from the start. Um, and great to have your own material. Now, what, what, you know, why not? Absolutely fantastic. Maybe you could write your own poem um, and perform that at some point. So well done, Archie. Um, then we had Annabelle, Talking Turkeys. Um, I tell you what uh, you were great at, Annabelle, was playing with the laugh, playing with the room. It's quite difficult when you've got an audience laughing when to keep going. Uh, and you really knew how to read the room there, which is a difficult skill, again. Uh, really good and, and great enthusiasm and, and comic timing uh, and you clearly enjoy it which makes me enjoy it so that's lovely and then lastly uh, we had Flora um, and uh, where are you Flora? Flora well done I, this is a, a, I love this poem it's a super poem and and you have such great presence and poise and really uh, took us on that uh, with that beautiful language you've got your mouth around all those words so um, really lovely um, uh, um, example of that poem so well done good so on to our first second and third for year eight so in third place we have Gil in second place Henrietta and in first place Annabelle <laughs> do this, a final overall prize. Um, but I do think we have got to uh, congratulate every single person in this room, because I know you all had a part to play, but also our amazing performance. A big, big round of applause to all of them. This is really difficult, but um, I've chosen this overall winner. I think uh, the engagement in the material and the overall performance um, was what I was so uh, impressed with, um, and uh, I'm going to give that to Jasper Marshall Lee. It's been wonderful. So much for coming, and thank you for doing such a fabulous job. Can we please show our appreciation for this time?
So, the House Poetry Recitation Competition 2021. Who is top dog? Um, I'm afraid I have to tell you that it's not Trafalgar. First and second were separated by just one point. One point only. And our winning house this afternoon is Waterloo. <laughs> Congratulations, Waterloo. Well done. And do we have a Waterloo captain to step forward and performer to step forward and receive the winner's certificate? Flora, would you like to come up, please? Well done. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> well, it has been an incredibly busy last six weeks. The this half of the term is almost over, half term is almost upon you. Uh, as I said this morning, uh, it's been an absolute joy watching and following all that you have been getting up to in so many different areas of school life. And it is a fitting way to end, I think, such a successful first half of this term with such a great event. So thank you performers and thank you all of you actually, as Mrs. Cryer said, for being such a brilliant audience as well and making it so much easier for these guys to perform so beautifully. Um, you'll need to listen very carefully to the instructions that you'll receive shortly uh, from Mr. Baker about how he is going to get you safely uh, out of here, back to your form rooms, and then on your way for half term. Have an absolutely wonderful, safe and healthy half term, all of you. I look forward to seeing you back in November.